last lecture. So, <coughs> so we saw that for rotationally invariant ensembles, we could write down the joint distribution of uh, all the n real eigenvalues, and this had this form that uh, I rescaled the lambda is square, so that it's of this form. Uh, And then we saw that we could interpret this as a Coulomb gas of charged particles on a line and uh, sitting in an external harmonic potential and repelling each other by this uh, logarithmic interaction. And then I talked about, you know, the, mm, the, and we saw that this term here, this repulsion term, it comes from the, this uh, Jacobian, from the Vandermont uh, term, Jacobian transformation. And, uh, and then we said that, okay, this was like what Herbert was talking about, the entrance ticket. So this is a starting point. And then you can do one d stat make on these problems and calculate various observables. And uh, so that was the sort of uh, general discussion. And uh, so what I want to do today uh, is sort of is to talk about the another interesting aspect of this, which is called the uh, Dyson Brownian motion or actually more uh, precisely, this is not a, I mean, okay, this will be Ornst and Willenbeck process. This is sort of, you know, another alternative way to arrive at the same result, which is sort of physically more transparent, but also it will tie up with uh, what Herbert was talking about, uh, namely the connection to non-intersecting Brownian motion and these, uh, these lines of ensembles and free fermions and so on. So I want to uh, discuss this uh, in detail today. Okay, so but before we start with the Dyson Brownian motion, I mean, uh, maybe it's just good to remind you, I mean, all of you know this, this is a trivial thing, but uh, just, just so that we know what we are talking about. So, so all of you know that, I mean, if you have a, just a single particle, first let's have a single classical particle. So for the moment, let's think, forget about random matrix, just think of a single classical particle moving in a potential. So you have some, some confining potential, uh, let's call it U of x, and uh, just one dimension for the moment. So you have this Langevin equation, which is uh, u prime of x. This is derivative. This is the force plus some noise term. Okay. And this is a Gaussian white noise, which means that expectation value is zero, and uh, the two-point correlation is just two d delta t one minus t two. So it's a white noise with diffusion constant d. So, so this large by equation, so we want to, for example, if you want to know what the solution for the Fokker-Planck equation is, so this is the, for each trajectory of the particle, the, so the particle is moving in this potential well, and so we can think of P of x t, which is the probability density for the particle at time t, and so you can write down easily from this, this Fokker-Planck equation for this, so that will be just starting from the initial condition. Uh, and uh, so <coughs> now if this ux is sufficiently confining, then uh, this will, you know, approach a stationary state in the long time limit. What that means is that the p of x t will become independent of time. So you can just set del p del t equal to zero. So then if you solve this equation, so you'll get, you know, the, this is, you can write down as a total derivative. So this is del p del x. Okay. 
equal to constant, and this is the current, right? Because this is, you can write down del del x of this current. And uh, if the system goes into just equilibrium things, then we set this current to be also zero. And then if you solve this equation, then you get the standard stationary state solution, which is uh, up to a normalization constant again, exponential minus 1 over d times ux. Okay. So this is the Boltzmann distribution, that uh, this is the energy, and the system approaches to this equilibrium state. And you can identify this 1 over t then as inverse temperature. So this is the famous Einstein relation, right? So, so this is the so basically, if you have this particle in this potential well, then uh, eventually the uh, it will approach to this uh, equilibrium state uh, in the long time limit. Okay. Now at finite time t, you have to solve this time-dependent Fokker-Planck equation, which is not always easy for arbitrary u of x. But uh, if you look at a particular case, so so let's say u of x is a just a quadratic potential, just a harmonic well. So in that case, so our equation of motion is just dx dt equal to minus mu x plus eta of t. And this is what is called the Ornstein Uhlenbeck process. Now this is a particularly simple process because you see this uh, is a linear equation. And uh, so you can write down the solution explicitly as uh, x of 0 times e to the power minus mu t plus e to the power minus mu t okay so it's just uh, you know it, it's, it's a linear function of this noise that noise is a gaussian process so therefore x of t is a gaussian process so all you need to know to calculate its distribution is just the first two moments mean and the variance okay so that's trivial to compute so the mean will be x x of 0 times e to the power minus mu t. And the variance also, okay, this is a simple exercise. You can just compute from just from this relation and use the property of the noise to show that the variance will be just d over mu 1 minus e to the power minus 2 mu t. Okay. And knowing that the process is Gaussian, therefore you can calculate the full time dependent probability distribution or propagator if you like. So this is just a Gaussian x minus this x of 0 e to the power minus mu t square. And then here you have this 2 pi times this sigma square. So this is the full time-dependent solution, and uh, and in fact, in these you can see that in the long time limit, this term goes to zero, this term goes to zero, and basically it goes back to this divided by whatever normalization here. Okay, so this is the stationary distribution, and also what you notice is that when mu goes to zero. So when mu goes to zero, this is just an ordinary Brownian motion. And you also recover that if you take for fixed t, if you take the mu going to zero limit, so this thing goes to the usual Brownian propagator, which is because when mu goes to zero, you just you know the first term you expand in Taylor series, so this will be two mu d times t. Uh, so there is a factor two here, I forgot. Okay. So it should be 2 b. Okay. 4 dt divided by square root of 4 pi dt. Okay. So Ornstein Ulbeck uh, process in the limit uh, when this uh, potential goes to 0, the, it becomes sort of flat and it's, in, it's just a Brownian motion in that case. Okay. Okay. So this is just trivial stuff, everybody knows. So, uh, so what we know is that, okay, so the, the Ornstein Ulbeck process at any time t has this. Uh, has this Gaussian solution and it approaches a stationary state in the long time limit. Okay, so that's all we need to know. And uh, then you can easily generalize this to uh, multi-particle case. So if you have a, so let's say uh, 
x1, x2, you know, n particle case, okay, and they are moving in some multidimensional potential. Let's call this E. And again, so we'll write down the Langevin equation, and in this case, it will be minus del E del xi plus again some noise. So for each particle independently, you have a Gaussian white noise. Yes. Okay, so this is called the overdamped Langevin equation. See, normally, when you write down a Newton's law, right? So you have a m d two x d d two plus some gamma dissipative term. So normally, you write down equal to force plus noise, right? So, so what happens is that in this long time limit, typically this term, this inertial term. Go, you know, it doesn't contribute that much. Okay, so this is what is called the overdamped limit. Okay, the friction is large. Okay, so in that case, you can just neglect this term, and this is what is called the standard Langevin equation. Okay, so uh, so now if I have a many particle pro problem, so again for each particle, it evolves uh, by this equation here, and. Again, you can write down the Fokker-Planck equation. You cannot solve it in general for arbitrary time t, but uh, but if you take the long time limit, the stationary state, so that will again up to some normalization. It will be exponential minus one over d times this u of x1, x2, x3, x n. Okay, so you should. Just remember this because we'll need this later. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Okay. So good. So so we just have this thing in the background that uh, we have this Ornstein Ullenbeck which goes into a Gaussian a stationary state and. Uh, and that we have, uh, you know, generally, if you have a multi-particle problem, it goes into the. This is just a statement of, you know, uh, equilibrium Boltzmann distribution. Okay. Okay. So now, what's now? Let's get back to the matrix. Uh, so, so again, you know, just think of our simplicity. Uh, let's start with real symmetric matrix beta equal to one. So we have a n by n matrix x i j. Now, so G G O E, which is this case, so Gaussian ensemble. So as we saw, that Gaussian ensemble means that I, you know, the entries of this matrix, I mean the the when i is less than j because it's real symmetric, so they are all independent Gaussian, right? So this is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Okay. So the idea <coughs> of Dyson is that, so imagine that now introduce a fictitious time. So it's not a real physical time, but imagine that you introduce a fictitious time and you make, make your matrix Xij. So let me write it this way. It's time dependent. So that means all the elements are time dependent now. And similarly symmetric counterpart here. Okay. So each of the entries is evolving in some, some fashion in, in this fictitious time t. Now what you want is that in the long time limit, it approaches to the our GOE ensemble, okay? Which means that the one way to do that is to say that okay, each element xij. So let's think of this. So let's take the diagonal elements and imagine that these diagonal elements are all doing. So okay, so xi plus some eta i t eta i i. Let me call it this way. 
Okay. So e this each of the diagonal elements is doing a Ornstein Lundberg process. Okay. And uh, the and the no this noise here is uh, min is zero, and uh, the variance is uh, again you know let's call it uh, what is my notation? Just let me take. Yeah. So this will be I take diffusion constant for this guy to be you'll see in a minute uh, to be d equal to one. So this is when i equal to j diagonal elements and the off diagonal elements. So they are also doing Ornstein Lundberg process with independent noise again. And here I take this eta ij square to be uh, delta of t minus t prime. So the diffusion constant I take to be half. Because why I'm doing this? Because you know that you know the long if you, if I give you this process in the long time limit, each of them. So these guys, they will, you know, we have just seen that. So any x i i, so it will go to e to the power minus with the diffusion constant is two here. So it will go to x i i square. Okay. And uh, whereas the off diagonal elements, so they will go to because of the diffusion constant is half here. So therefore it will be one over d. Remember. So therefore, you know, basically this will go into some overall distribution, joint distribution of all these guys in the long time limit, stationary limit, will uh, go to uh, uh, precisely uh, okay. So here are all ij. So this is basically essentially it will be a minus half trace of x squared. Okay. So if I induce a sort of fictitious motion that each a matrix element is evolving by Ornstein Lundberg process independently, then I know that the joint distribution of the matrix elements in the long time limit will go to the our target space, which is the GOE basically. Okay. So so the idea is that okay, so 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 you know, I introduce this whatever initial position you start from and you evolve these matrix elements by this time dependence and you will arrive into the you know intended distribution stationary distribution which is the goe okay and then the idea is that that at each instant of time you know i can diagonalize my matrix matrix and i can get these eigen values lambda 1 but this will be now time dependent right so these eigen values will evolve in time and uh, so if you can find out what is the sort of, you know, the entries are evolving like this. So how does the eigenvalues evolve in time? So I want to, you know, write down some Langevin equation, equivalent Langevin equation for the eigenvalues. And uh, then if you plot this, you know, these eigenvalues, lambda i, as a function of time t. So initially, you know, they will be somewhere here. And they will evolve in time. And we'll see that you know they cannot, they will not be able to cross each other, and eventually in the long time limit, long time limit, they will also you know if I take a slice here, at long time limit, very long time limit, then the distribution of the eigenvalues, okay, so that will become stationary distribution, and uh, so we want to compute that. So that's the program, right? So given these dynamics of the entries. I want to first write down sort of equ an equ equation of motion, the Langevin equation of motion for the eigenvalues. And then from that, we want to see what happens at a long time limit. I would like to solve the Fokker Planck equation for these guys and find out the stationary distribution. Okay, so that's the program. Yes, yes, this is very important. You will see that. I mean, 
No, you cannot do it for arbitrary, you know, matrices basically. So, you know, this is this will be true only for rotational invariant pins. Because otherwise, you could use this method to calculate the joint distribution for any uh, these things. But you know, it works only for rotational invariant ensembles. Okay. <coughs> All right. So, <coughs> so what's the idea? So then, you know, I mean, okay. In general, so therefore, I I write down this Langevin equation. Okay, so I want to. Okay, so maybe okay. Where this noise noise correlation they are independent from each index uh, for each element. Okay, and this is you remember that okay in general I'll write down as Gij delta of t minus t prime, where the I told you already the diagonal elements are two and the off diagonal elements are one. Okay. So if I look at this, so you see that I, I can write down the x i j at time t plus delta t is just a discretization basically, time discretization. So this will be x i j at time t minus x i j at time t delta t. Right, I'm just multiplying by delta t plus eta i j t delta t. Okay. In a small time interval t to t plus delta t, it evolves by this equation. So you can think of this as a matrix evolution. So I can think of this as a um, sort of operator, the Hamiltonian operator. Think of the x i j as your uh, some Hamiltonian. So therefore, this h at time t plus delta t you can write down which is the okay i'll call it h0 plus delta t times h1 okay where this h1 operator is just minus h0 because h1 you see this is de delta t times this uh, so h this is just exactly h0 is x itself okay so this is h0 and so this is minus h0 plus this matrix eta. Okay. Yeah. No, no, white noise, you see, no, no, but this is, okay. So white noise means what exactly? I mean, I think Harvard explained it already. So white noise means that it's a Gaussian process, okay? And uh, the probability distribution of a white noise, okay? So this is just exponential minus half eta squared tau d tau right so this is a you know if you think of a white noise process okay then the probability distribution of a particular trajectory of the white noise is given by this so which means that each instant of time you can think of these are independent gaussian random variables you can just you know discretize this guy right so if you discretize this guy this will be eta i square times this delta tau Right, each each time instant. Okay, so it's like the independent noise; they are uncorrelated in time. So you see the variance of this noise. Okay, so the variance of eta i square at each point is just one over dt, basically. Okay, so the white noise, the simplest way to think of it is it's just a Gaussian variable with mean zero, and its variance is just one over delta t. Okay, so this delta t is what gives when you calculate the correlation function. You get this delta function here. So the interpretation of this delta function is just, you know, you just think of this as one over delta t. Okay. Okay. So, <coughs> so we have this so evolution equation here, right? So my Hamiltonian just evolves in a small time delta t from uh, let's say h zero to by this perturbation delta t times h one, where h one is minus h zero plus this noise matrix. Okay. So then the uh, idea is that you know so it's like a, you know doing quantum mechanics but where you just you know this is just a perturbation matrix so so you want to, you can use the perturbation theory to calculate how the eigenvalues are evolving okay so that's that's the idea of uh, dyson okay so 
So, <clears throat> now what you can do is that at time t, okay, you have a matrix, and I can instantaneously diagonalize this matrix, right, h0. So h0 is at time t. So, you know, I'm just saying that, okay, I'm at time t here, and I go a little bit time t plus delta t, and I want to see how the eigenvalues evolve in this small time interval delta t. Okay? So, <coughs> so what I can do is at time t, I can you know, make a similarity transformation because it's a real symmetric matrix, and I can diagonalize instantaneously the uh, h0 t, and I'm going to work in that basis. Okay? So, so that means at time t, if you like, you're, you have diagonalized your h0 t. So that means you know, it has these values, diagonal, which is functions of t. And I go a little bit of time delta t by perturbing with this additional term here. And I want to see how this guy evolves. Okay? So, equation was diagonal. Yes. No, what do you mean, diagonal? No, no, remember this. Here you have this x11t, one one x12t, one etc. No, equation by equation, they do not mix, of course. Evolution of each element is by itself, yes, certainly. But the eigenvalues do get correlated, right? If you instantaneously diagonalize it, you will see the eigenvalues. So that's the whole idea, the how to calculate the eigenvalues. Even though the matrix entries are independent, evolution, but... Sorry? Yes. H, this H matrix is just the X matrix. I mean, I mean, I'm just using the quantum mechanical. I'm thinking of this matrix X. This is what is H naught, okay? And I, I evolve a little bit time delta t. So then H at you know time delta t is just x1 t plus delta t, x2 t plus x1 2 t plus delta t, etc. This is just just this evolution. Yeah, yeah, just matrix itself is how is it evolving, okay? And now I want to diagonalize it and see how the, uh, how the eigenvalues evolve, okay? Okay, so what you can do is just to, uh, you know, uh, just standard perturbation theory. I mean, just, you remember that in basically quantum mechanics, if you have H equal to H0 plus epsilon H1, so I, I put up with some parameter epsilon, small parameter epsilon, a Hamiltonian H0 to H1. So <coughs> then the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix H0 are going to change. And uh, so let's say if I say EMs are unperturbed eigenvalues of H0, I mean, they are uh, eigenvalues of H0, and uh, if you say UM are the corresponding eigenvectors, so then, you know, UM prime, so you make a small perturbation, and you ask, you know, how does it evolve as a function, I mean, uh, for, uh, under this perturbation, so, you know, it'll be first order, then it will be second order, and so on, right? And similarly, the eigenvalues will evolve. So as I perturb, so this will be EM, and you recall from your basic quantum mechanics books. So the first order perturbation will be just this, and there will be second order term, and we need to go up to second order precisely because of the fact that the noise e has a delta function correlation. So this will be UK H1, this matrix element square, divided by EM minus EK. Okay. 
plus okay higher order terms so everybody remembers this right this is basic quantum mechanics uh, books which tells you you know how uh, sort of eigen value cha changes as you make a small perturbation okay so this is the idea so now so now instantaneously we have diagonalized so this is our h not and epsilon is going to be this delta t and h1 is just this this matrix which is minus xij plus the noise okay and we want to see how the eigen values evolve under this this transform uh, under this uh, perturbation change okay so So when you instantaneously diagonalize it, so I'm working in that basis UM basis, which is the the di, you know the eigenvectors of this H not T, and uh, so therefore you know just using this result now my eigenvalues are I'll denote by lambda m, so lambda m at time t plus delta t, which is exactly this EM prime. Okay, so this will be lambda m, okay, whatever it was there, plus delta t the first order term and first order term we have seen that this will be um and h1 is just minus h0 plus this noise matrix um and then there will be a second order term delta t squared which is this guy here k not equal to m plus you know order delta t cube which will not need eventually okay so this is the sort of evolution you already start seeing that you know in the first order term you know they, they, they don't the eigen values don't get correlated the correlation comes only from the second order term here okay and uh, so if i just evaluate this guy here so this will be lambda m so this is lambda m at time t basically right so the first element here um minus h not um so that is just minus lambda m right because this is exactly the eigen vector of h not okay so this will be minus lambda m times delta t plus delta t times um eta um plus this term here now here you see that because k is not equal to m so therefore you know because this is uk is the eigen vector of h not so k is not equal to m so this term is not going to come because they are orthogonal uh, eigen vectors so this will be zero exactly so all you have here is uk eta um square over lambda m minus lambda k plus order delta t q so very good so now what is the point the point is that you know and this is where the the the, the so so far i have not used the fact that this is a rotational invariant tensor you can do it for any matrix right but now the point is that this it comes here that this eta matrix eta is a gaussian matrix remember okay with this exactly so when i make this transformation at time t to go into this basis so it does not change the distribution of eta okay the ensemble of eta if you like okay so ensemble of eta still remains un uncorrelated and gaussian okay because this is what i sh showed you under similarity transformation a rotational invariant ensemble doesn't change okay so that means in this basis also you know i can uh, the eta mm you know it's a gaussian variable with uh, with exactly uh, same correlation as before i mean uh, so this will be uh, mean is zero and the variance for the diagonal elements will be exactly uh, two times uh, delta function and similarly for the off diagonal elements 
Originally, I, I defined in the XIJ basis, whatever basis. But the point is that I'm going, I'm making this rotation, and even the, you know, under rotation, this is invariant, the distribution of the noise, because it's a Gaussian. And therefore, this will be, you know, when m is not equal to n, so this will be 0, and this will be delta function of t minus t prime. So this is where the assumption of the rotational invariance comes in. Okay. So once you have this, okay, so then uh, the next st step is to uh, is to sort of uh, okay. So this is uh, so therefore I'll just write it down again. So lambda m prime is lambda m minus lambda m delta t plus this eta mm delta t, right? Because this is just the matrix elements of this uh, this guy here, plus delta t square is eta k m square over lambda m minus lambda k k not equal to m plus order delta t cube. So remember, these are random variables still, okay? So the so the next step is that you write down this. I mean, you'll, I mean, I, I have to do this to to show you exactly how it comes. So uh, so I'm, that's why I'm doing it in, in somewhat detail. But this is quite beautiful actually. So I just add and subtract this average value of square. Just this term, okay? And then. So lambda m prime will be lambda m minus lambda m delta t plus eta. Okay. So this this guy here now this divided by that is a deterministic term, right? And then I have stochastic term, which is just mm delta t plus delta t square times k not equal to m. Now, why did I keep this term? I mean, this is order delta t square, but the point is precisely what uh, you know, what I was saying just then is that uh, you see the the eta square. You have to you know, this is a noise. I mean, okay, instead of saying that okay, you're doing eta calculus or something, very simply speaking, eta square, as I said, it's actually of order one over delta t. It's exactly one over delta t, right? Times the whatever the variance is. Okay, this is the white noise. Okay. So therefore, you see, this guy is of order 1 over delta t. And so this whole term here is the same, same order as, uh, as delta t. Now, the uh, higher order terms that I had not kept in, you can check that they will be you know, higher order in delta t. So I'm keeping only up to terms of order delta t. So if I do that, then uh, I have to keep this second order term. So therefore, this guy, we have seen that when k is not equal to m, the, the variance of this is just, you know, the, uh, the di off-diagonal element is actually um, 1 over delta t. And therefore, so what you have is therefore lambda m at time t plus delta t is lambda m at time t minus lambda m delta t plus delta t times k not equal to m plus a sort of noise term. Sorry, question? Yes. Yes. I had a time t, yes. Yes. But so uh, the exchange of variance, I mean, over this rotation, 
Yes. Yes. Precisely, because eta is e to the power minus trace eta square. So when you make a tr similarity transformation, it will be exactly remain as trace eta square. Okay. So that's the point. Okay. So it's quite important to keep this variance. Okay. Okay. Plus a sort of noise term, uh, and this noise term here. Okay. Times. Uh, okay. So I mean, overall, I mean, you know, this is this is exactly this this guy here. Okay. This whole thing. Okay. So I'll just write it like this. So this is xi m delta t is uh, precisely the noise term here. Okay, and uh, so you can okay then you can argue and you can okay this I'm not going to do but you can check yourself that this xi m eta t you know this xi m variable itself okay it's it's easy to check that its mean value is zero and you can check that its variance is going to be 1 over delta t. Okay. So in fact, the whole point is to say that you know this guy itself becomes a white noise in the limit delta t goes to 0. Okay. So then we have it. So, so what you see, therefore, is that d lambda m dt. Now I divide by dt and take the limit delta t goes to 0. So this will be minus lambda m plus k not equal to m 1 over lambda m minus lambda k plus a noise term. And this noise is again a white noise. And the, with, unit, with diffusion constant, you know, if you write in general psi m square as 2d over delta t, then this is, means that d equal to half here. So this is the equation of motion, Langevin equation of motion for the eigenvalues. When the, so again, I mean, just remember this picture that your, your system matrix is moving in time, evolving in time. And uh, so the eigenvalues also evolve in time. And uh, so you know, they start at whatever initial uh, time this is time. So you have a, a line, you know, a, um, sort of ensemble of uh, eigenvalues. Okay, this is lambda I, lambda m t versus t. So they are evolving, and because of this term, you see that you know two eigenvalues they repel each other precisely because there's a, this is a repulsion term, right? If they come very close to each other, this term becomes it's a positive term and it diverges, which means that you know they they, they don't like to be sit, sitting next to each other basically. They don't cross basically. Okay? Is explicitly this term which uh, makes them repel each other. Okay? Yes? Why, why are we doing this? Okay, because I want to calculate the distribution of the eigenvalues. Okay? No, no, but I want to, I mean, I told you this derivation, right? This P lambda 1, lambda 3, lambda n, okay? Okay? So this, is, this provides an alternative derivation of this result. That's what I'm going to show you, okay? So this provides an alternative derivation, and it's actually physically intuitive to see how this, because, you know, when I did this derivation before, it was using these Jacobian terms, right? You know, you would make a transformation, and you really don't see any physics in it, okay? So, I mean, the, where is the repulsion term coming from, okay? So, uh, so then you can sort of see that if you, m you know, make this time evolution of this matrix, okay? And uh, then you can sort of see how just by you know second order perturbation theory you see how these uh, changes comes in okay so once we have this i have not finished this story so once you have this langevin equation so now i want to find out so what is the so i can write down the focke planck equation for the lambda itself okay and then i can ask what is the you know stationary distribution of that okay so just have a little patience 
Okay, so I have a set of Langevin, you know, set of uh, particles which are which are moving according to this equation of motion, stochastic equation of motion, and I can, as I told you before, I mean, you know, in general, you, you remember that I, I first before I started, I said that if you have a general motion like this, then this goes into a stationary state, which is again the Gibbs state. And this will be, you know, e to the power minus one over the diffusion constant times this, you know, energy function, right? That you can show explicitly by solving the Fokker-Planck equation. So, so now we have a, so we have a multi-particle system which are where the derivative of the energy function is precisely that. Okay. So immediately you see, therefore, that the joint distribution of these guys in the long time limit will go into a Gibbs state. Okay, which is precisely the integral of this guy, right? So if when you integrate this, so you get exactly what I wrote down, namely uh, beta is one, so it's just half. up to an annihilation constant so you see these these eigen values okay so they are going so the, 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 you know they are they are they are equation of motion langevin equation is like this it approaches a stationary so therefore the probability distribution of these guys so if i at a fixed time t if i look at the positions of these eigen values okay and i ask you know what is the sort of joint distribution of these positions of these eigen values then it becomes independent of time as time goes to infinity and that distribution is given precisely by this okay so this provides and sort of this i did it for beta equal to 1 and this is exactly for beta equal to 1 you see this but you can actually do it for okay this is a exercise if you do it for arbitrary beta then you will see that you know okay so the noise things just changes, this diffusion constant changes to beta by 2. I mean, this d equal to half, it just becomes beta over 2. Okay. I did it for beta equal to 1, but you can just check that this will be beta over 2, and therefore you can do the same exercise, and uh, you arrive at this, uh, this same distribution. So this is just an alternative derivation of the joint distribution for rotational invariant ensembles, okay? But, you know, it's very useful because, you know, it it sort of makes this connection to uh, to the things that I'm going to talk about, to non-intersecting Brownian motions and so on. So, okay, yeah. I did not, no, because I mean, okay, you, you have to work on it, okay? I cannot do everything on the board, right? So you have to just go and do it yourself, okay? Just check, because that's not a, it's not an easy statement, okay? But you can, you have to show this is what Dyson showed, that this will be white noise, okay? white uncorrelated noise. Uh, so is it, is it correct that uh, the center of the was at minus Sorry? Yes. No. Okay. That's the whole point. So I mean, <laughs> exactly. So you see, I mean, average value is zero, variance is this, and all the higher order things will be of higher order in delta t square. Okay. So therefore, you know, when in the limit delta t goes to zero, to leading order, it becomes a Gaussian white noise. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's one way to sort of generate this, basically. I mean, you know, if you want to, for example, you know, uh, generate rotational invariant in symbols, so uh, you can, you know, simulate this eigenvalue, these things, and, you know, just uh, from the eigenvalue, and if you also keep track of the eigenvectors, and then you just make the rotation and go back to the original uh, ensemble. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, yes. Okay. All right, so, so now, uh, okay, just one small change so here i mean okay this this noise remember uh, had this thing so i mean i could sort of say that this noise is just square root of 2 beta times eta mt 
where this is just uh, unit variance. Okay, just I mean I just took scale the variance outside here. Once you have that, I mean okay, I mean just for my own uh, notations, I mean you can also rescale. You see the lambda m's. If I rescale to be uh, square root of okay, what is the rescaling? Just so that I get the factors correct. Yeah. So if you now you know just rescale the lambda and you know go to lambda m twiddle, then you can see that this will be lambda m twiddle plus beta by two. It's just just a matter of convenience. Nothing deep here. Okay. So by this rescaling, we just you know just bring this factor from here to here, nothing else, and so that you know it's easier to keep track to say that this guy has unit variance. That means eta m t is zero, and eta m square is just delta function. Okay, so so now I can get rid of this tilde and just call it like this. Now remember that this is the case. When the matrix elements are doing Dyson, you know, onstein ruhlenberg process. Okay. Now sometimes you will see that that people actually study also Dyson Brownian motion. Okay. Which means that you don't have this term. Okay. So in that case, you can ask the same question. That is, you know, each part, each element, matrix element is evolving by Brownian motion, and uh, and so the eigenvalues will evolve just by this equation without that. But in this case, of course, because there is no confining potential, so effectively, the, you know, there will be no stationary state. Okay, so it won't be stationary, but you can still ask, how does these eigenvalues evolve in time? There is no stationary state, so so it will actually. So in that case, if you plot, you know, they will be like this. There will be a typical spread of order square root t here. Okay, and uh, but you can still ask at a given time t. What is the joint distribution of uh, these guys? Okay, so this is what is called the Dyson-Brownian motion. And if we have this term, then it's the Dyson-OU process. Okay, so now, what's the connection to uh, non-intersecting Brownian motion that Harvard was talking about? Dyson-Brownian motion is not exactly the same as as non-intersecting Brownian motion. So what's the what's the sort of relation? And this is and with that I'll just finish this first half. So now, <coughs> so the point is that okay. So if I want to study this this so think of the Dyson Brownian motion now. So we don't have this term here. Okay, just this. So I have this, you know, bunch of particles which are moving according to this Langevin equation. Okay. So to calculate, for instance, you know, what is the joint distribution of these these guys here? So what do I have to do? I have to solve uh, the Fokker-Planck equation, right? So what's the Fokker-Planck equation? So so let's call it this Dyson-Brownian motion, dBm of Lambda by lambda vector, I mean the ensemble of lambda one, lambda three, lambda n. Okay. So suppose I say that you know it goes at time t, it will arrive at lambda starting from some initial positions zero. Okay. So this is the propagator for this process. So the propagator will satisfy the Fokker-Planck equation. So you can easily write down the Fokker-Planck equation. So that will be okay, because this is the drift term. And then this is the diffusion term. So, diffusion term gives you this. 
because the diffusion constant d is uh, just a half and uh, and you have this is the drift term okay so this is the Fokker Planck equation and uh, so now how do you solve this Fokker Planck equation well I mean uh, it's not easy to generally solve but what you can do first is to uh, just make a transformation this is the standard transformation which takes a Fokker Planck operator to a Schrodinger operator so what I'll do is I'll just you know write just make a change of variable again okay so let me just write e to the power and I, I can divide by this is not very important but the initial values times some psi which is again lambda t so i just multiply this factor just you know in this equation you just replace this guy just multiply by this factor and uh, just write down the equation for this psi of lambda t okay. so i won't do the computation in detail but uh, what you will find if you do this calculation just okay this is a whole exercise okay so if you just substitute this here and just work it out and uh, what you will find is the following this is the standard substitution you know which takes Fokker Planck to Schrodinger operator if you do that so you will get Okay, so uh, this is just an exercise. Okay, just check; it's a straightforward exercise. So if you have that, and so this this guy, you know, in the lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda n plane, you have to solve these equations. Okay, but uh, but you can also check that this this psi, you know, uh, also for Dyson Brown in motion. When you solve this, you have to solve in because you know because of this equation here. You see that if you order initially these things they remain ordered at all time so you have to solve this in the plane for example for two particles lambda 1 lambda 2 so lambda 2 is bigger than lambda 1 so you have to solve in this plane here with absorbing boundary condition along this diagonal line okay. so in general so this will be this this is called the wild chamber and uh, you have to solve the diffusion equation this this object here this equation here with the boundary condition that whenever any of the two part you know e these things are equal it should go to zero okay so so you see that this equation here okay is exactly like a Schrodinger equation okay in imaginary time but with a potential which is like inverse square potential right with an amplitude which is beta minus two so this is what is called the Calogero Sutherland model Yeah, continuum version. It's not the lattice. Yes. Bosonic and fermion. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, precisely. No, that's true. No, I agree. Yes. So this is the sort of uh, the Scalogero Sutherland model with the inverse square interaction, and uh, and you see that beta equal to two uh, plays a very special role because when beta equal to two, you know, this term just goes away. So this is the GUE case, and then you are just reduced to free fermions. This is exactly what Harvard was talking about. So for beta equal to 2, you just have non-intersecting Brownian motions. Okay. 
So all you have to solve is just a you know uh, solution of you know diffusion equation, but in this in this wild chamber with absorbing boundary condition, and the solution of that. So in that case, so basically, so in the beta equal to two case, therefore the Dyson Brownian motion is exactly equivalent to non-intersecting Brownian motion. So you can think of these as Brownian walkers with the constraint that they don't cross each other. Okay, and uh, and uh, then if you look at the uh, their joint distribution at so if I want to solve this guy here this Schrodinger equation uh, so it's actually this is what Herbert was writing down yesterday so uh, you can write down as a determinant you know th and this is very simple to see because you know you, let's say again two particle case right so two particle case I want to solve a diffusion equation here with the absorbing boundary condition along this okay so how do I find the solution so psi you know uh, you just write the propagator itself I mean, for Brownian motion. So if I take x1, x2, two particles at time t, okay, starting from, let's say, initial positions a1, a2, at 0. So I write down the propagator first, x1 minus a1 square over 4 dt times x2 minus a2 square over 4 dt. So this is the full plane solution okay so this is just a product of the independent uh, brownian motion so this will be the thing if i didn't have this absorbing boundary condition okay now i have this absorbing boundary condition which means that p must be equal to 0 on this line diagonal line so what do i have to do so basically you know i have to anti-symmetrize this so that means i you know i just interchange x1 and x2 and put a negative sign this here so this will be x2 minus a1 square So you can check now that this satisfies the diffusion equation and it satisfies the absorbing boundary condition. Okay? But you know this this guy here, you can write it as a two by two determinant okay? with this propagator as the element. And this is exactly what uh, what Herbert was writing down yesterday. Okay? And so therefore, you know, when you go to n particles, all that happens is that you have again you have to take the each permutation, you have to put a sign of permutation, and then whole thing just becomes a determinant. Okay? And so this determinant whose elements are just the propagators themselves, individual propagators, okay? And this is, you know, this is there's a name for it. This is called the Carlin mcgregor formula. Okay. So, so basically, I mean, so for beta equal to 2, the Dyson-Brownian motion and non-intersecting Brownian motions, they are, they are exactly equivalent to each other. And... Uh, and in that case, you know, you can make a lot of progress and, you know, in the sense, so if you calculate the joint distribution of all the positions of these particles here at time t, I mean, just by analyzing this determinant, I'll not, you know, do it in detail, but uh, what you will find is, uh, again, up to normalization, it's exponential minus xi squared over 4 dt times okay if you don't have the, just this so this will be just xi minus xj okay this is a little bit confusing maybe for some of you because this is this is beta equal to 1 so okay let me not make this statement here but we can discuss this later but uh, but the beta equal to 2 basically that the mm, uh, random matrix eigenvalues they evolve in the same way as non intersecting so dyson brownian motion is equivalent to uh, equivalent to um, non-intersecting Brownian motion. Okay? So this you can think of this assembly of lines which is moving uh, uh, like this. Okay. So I think I can stop now and probably go on to the next one. This. Okay.
Okay, so uh, so the second half, basically, so now we have sort of, you know, I've been spent enough time on this uh, joint distribution, how to derive it, and uh, let's now uh, just discuss the Coulomb gas and uh, technique to, to calculate some observable, right? So, uh, so once again, so I, I always uh, rescale this uh, lambda I to be this. So this is our joint distribution, where this is a normalization constant, which says that it must be such that the total probability is normalized to 1. So which means this is just uh, exactly this integral. So this is, you can interpret this as partition function of this Coulomb gas. going from minus infinity to plus infinity. OK. So so, so this is the problem. And you want to you know, calculate some observable. So first thing you can ask that, as I said, you know, this will be these particles sitting on a line, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, let's say. And you can think of them as positions on a line. And with a, they are sitting in this harmonic potential, which is this guy here. This is a classical problem. And uh, they are repelling each other. So it's an interacting, long-ranged 1D stat mix system. Okay? And I also mentioned in my previous lecture uh, yesterday, the day before yesterday, that uh, in the large end limit, I mean, this Coulomb gas technique can be very useful for calculating some global observable. So one global observable was this average density of states, right? Average density of eigenvalues, which I was defining as uh, Okay, so that it's normalized to 1. So it's just a fraction of eigenvalues between lambda and lambda plus d lambda. And uh, so we said that this has a weakness semicircular form, and I just want to show you how to derive that using this uh, Coulomb gas technique. Okay? So <coughs> now, um, so one thing is that, I mean, I also, you know, sort of made this, you know, simple back of the hand calculation to expect to find out the typical scale of lambda in the large end limit. And I just want to repeat that. You see, this guy here, the first term, it, it scales like lambda square, lambda typical. You know, if you take a typical lambda times n, because there are n such terms in it. Okay, so that's the energy scale of the first term. Okay, and because they compete with each other, so they have, you know, they, they, they must be of the same order. And what is the order of this term here? Because it's i not equal to this. Everybody is interacting with everybody else. So this is of order n squared in the large n limit. Okay? So therefore, uh, this means that lambda t typical scales like square root of n. Okay? So sometimes, you know, I mean, so you can say that, which means that you know, this guy must therefore have a scaling form, which is uh, some function of lambda over square root of n by 1 over square root of n, because this is the scale of square root of n. Okay? Yes. The argument is that if there are two terms, energy, right? I told you that they compete with each other, right? This guy, you know, the potential is trying to push them towards the center, okay? And there's a repulsion term which is trying to spread them apart, okay? So, I mean, you know, the, 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 the so essentially, when this, you know, the system will settle down into configuration, where these two terms will you know, exactly co compensate each other, and it will be something like that. Okay? So, so they have to be of the same order, because if they are not, the, not of the same order, then you will go the totally trivial cases, basically. Okay? So these two terms, I mean, you have to just to, this is just an estimation of how, how the, you know, just an uh, energy scale estimation. Okay? I'm not, you, know, you, you can do the exact computation, and you'll find, a, find out the same thing. But you can guess it just by looking at this. Okay? Yeah. 
I have, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that more precisely later, yeah. No, so far, I mean, you know, in this uh, discrete notation, there is no entropy term, okay? But we'll come to that when you go to the continuum limit. So, <coughs> lambda typically is of order square root of n, and uh, so sometimes, you know, I mean, what you do is, you know, often you will see that, you know, you can write in the beginning, you can therefore rescale, you can sort of say that lambda is sort of, you know, so if I just rescale it right from the beginning, so then, you see, uh, if I just substitute this guy here, they call it lambda and twiddle, and then there will be factor n which will come here, and uh, these guys will also become tilde, and there will be a log n times n into n minus 1, which is just a trivial constant, which will just go outside, so you don't care. Okay? So, so often in the RMT literature, sometimes you will find, you know, without the n, and sometimes you will find with, with the n, but it's just a rescaling of the uh, eigenvalues, basically. So if I do the rescale, uh, I'm going to right now work in these rescaled units. So if I do rescale, then, then you will expect that in the long, large n limit, so now the scale is order 1, because uh, once I have rescaled it, and then it will be some function, uh, same function, but with uh, lambda. Okay? So the n dependence is already absorbed in the eigenvalues. So I'm going to work in that rescaling unit. Okay? So once I've rescaled it, so now all the lambdas are of order 1, okay? And I want to know, know what is the sort of the average density, first of all, okay? So how do you proceed? So the whole idea is that in the large n limit, so this is just a discrete set of points here on the line, right? So I want to somehow go in the large n limit to a continuum description, okay? So, <coughs> and I want to evaluate this partition function. So I want to evaluate... So how do I do that? So the, the so the you know the the way to do this is that okay. So first, I mean, you know, it's like you want to somehow in the large n limit, what will happen is that these points they'll be very close to each other, so they'll be very dense, okay. And uh, so we want to coarse grain the system, okay. And describe in terms of a density, you know, something like this, you know, I don't know. So this is something like a density, so. Uh, So instead of discrete points, so I want to go from the multidimensional integral to a sort of functional integral. And the way to do that is that you define first, given this, I can always define an empirical density, rho hat lambda n. So I just define this object. Okay? There is no averaging here. Just, 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 a, I, I'm just a definition. Okay? So this is just a definition. Okay? So. Okay, I won't do in too many details here, but then you, you see that I, this whole object here, I can write in terms of this, uh, this empirical density. So it's my given sample, I just look at this empirical density. Of course, this is all, all the subtle points, because this is a sum of delta functions, it's not a continuous function, all this, but let's just ignore this a la physicists and uh, just write this, you know, imagine that this is sort of a continuous function. And then, uh, so this guy is, okay. Plus there will be some leftover term here. I'm just writing the energy right now, okay? So, so let's just writing this energy, minus energy, if you like. Okay. So, so this, this guy, the weight of this, you can write down this, okay, plus there will be some correction terms because, you know, you, is, okay, I mean, you have to be a little bit careful when lambda i is very close to lambda j, There's, you have to introduce a cutoff and so on, but okay, roughly speaking, I mean, I'm, you, know, this is, you can go into all these details, but let's not, let's not go into that, okay. So, so then, so the basic idea is that, okay, so you have this, what does it core screening mean? That means you have this, uh, you know, multiple integral. So the idea is that okay. So you say that okay. I first fix the density. Okay. So I want to do it this integral in two steps. Okay. 
whatever this energy function. Okay. Uh, first, I make this constraint that I look at all pos possible positions of the charges compatible with a given density. Okay. So I fix this density, let's say. So I have to fix it by a delta function like this. So it's like partial tracing. Okay. So first, I, you know, you give me a density. Okay, I, I, I first fix the overall density, and I sum over all microscopic configurations compatible with this density, and then finally, I integrate over all possible densities. Okay, so this is a functional integral. Means that, you know, you just think of all possible densities, and uh, so for each density, you first sum over microscopic configurations, and then finally, you sum over all possible densities. That's what this means. Okay. So this I can do always. Uh, and the point is, that you see that this guy here, this energy function that I wrote down, this is only a function of this density. So you know, this guy can come, come out of this. And then you have this, you know, so this is like an entropy term. You see this e to the power, I mean, because this is like, you know, summing over all possible microscopic configurations that correspond to a particular density. So, uh, so in general, so you you'll write down this as exponential of some density uh, of some entropy. Okay, so this is called entropy term, and you can show. I mean, okay, I'm not going to show it in detail. I mean, this is sort of quite easy to show that this term is always going to be of order n in the large n limit. Okay, entropy is always extensive. Okay, so. So the whole point is that here, you see that normally, I mean, you know, when you do this statmec, I mean, there will be energy and the entropy term, and usually they are both extensive. That the energy and entropy are both of the same order n, but in this particular system, because it's a long-range system, the energy is always of order n square, whereas the entropy term is going to be of order n. So entropy term is always negligible compared to the energy term in the large n limit. So this is the point. So, so there will be an entropy term, and you have to be a little bit careful to, to, be, to uh, you know, if you want to really do it. But if you are interested only in the large end limit, we can ignore this entropy term, and uh, you know, so the, so I, I can just. So here there will be terms of order n, which has the entropy, and which also has the correction terms that come from this self energy when uh, lambda I minus lambda j is very small, but they are of order n, and I'm going to ignore them. Okay? But you have a constraint here, which I forgot to write, which says that this function must be normalized to 1. Right? I mean, you can define any function, but we are looking at only functions that satisfy this, uh, this thing that uh, it has this particular definition. Right? You know, if you have this, by definition, you know, such a function is integral is 1. Sorry? I don't understand how you ignore that first. Huh? Why do you say you No, because you see the energy is of order n square. And this is entropy is going to be order n. So in the large n limit, so you want to do a saddle point calculation. Okay. So in the large n limit, the entropy term is sort of negligible, basically. But you have to, you know, you have to keep track of this, this, uh, this constraint here, okay, but this constraint, you know, delta function, you can always, you know, you, 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 okay. So you know the delta function is a representation, right? So I can always write down this as, uh, you know, delta k. Ah, sorry. Okay. So. So you can so we had this delta function of rho lambda d lambda minus one, 
So I can replace this delta function by using this kind of uh, integral representation. And okay, you can go into the complex things. So then this will be dq over 2 pi i times e to the power. Okay, let's write k. And, uh, but I want to, you know, this is important, so I want to, this will be of the same scale, so I can always rescale k to order n square, there will be overall n square here, so I can always write it this way, okay. And I can also make k to q going to imaginary, so like this, okay. So there is no i then, it's just going in the along the imaginary plane. So all I'm saying is that, you know, it's not very important, but you know this is just to say that uh, the the partition function, therefore, you can write down as a functional integral over all possible density of states times exponential minus beta by two n square. Okay. So, th so this, this just this you know this constraint just effectively becomes a Lagrange multiplier. So let me uh, just write it down, and then you will see in a minute. So I have this energy term rho square. This is the potential energy term. You know, physically it's clear, right? This is just you know the, if you have a certain density, it's filling. This is the energy potential energy of this term. And uh, and then there's a the repulsion energy which is log of lambda minus lambda prime, rho lambda, rho lambda prime. This is the repulsive energy, okay. And then I have a mu naught times rho lambda d lambda, okay, minus one, but you can absorb in these things, okay. So this, this, just, this just tells you, okay, you can put a minus one if you like here. So this is just comes from this Q which I call mu naught. Okay, so this is the, you can see that this is just Lagrange multiplier which enforces that your uh, rho lambda is normalized to one. Okay, so so basically by this coarse graining, you have reduced your original discrete integral into a sort of functional integral over this means, and I have neglected here order n terms which are for entropy. And now you you have you see after all these things, so, so what's the main main point? So the main point is that somehow you know you you got a big factor n square outside, okay? and you know that when in physics, I mean, whenever we have a integral or something with a big factor there, you can always use the the saddle point method, that is method of steepest descent. So so if you call so basically the point is that in the large n limit, somehow that uh, you know it will pick up only the contribution which minimizes this, this object. This is the idea of minimizing the free energy, right, in general in statistical mechanics. And here it's uh, just a energy, there's no entropy term, so you have to somehow minimize this energy, okay. So let me call this as, you know, action or energy or whatever. It's a functional equation. So then in the large n limit, this will be to the power minus two leading order, beta square times this, this you know, the value of this this uh, action evaluated at the saddle point density, right? If there is such a saddle point density, so this is a function. Okay, so that's the idea. So how do I get this uh, saddle point density? I just have to minimize this guy, right? Because large end limit, that's the most dominant contribution will come from this minimum. So I have to just you know look for the saddle point density. So this is a functional derivative which should be equal to zero at uh, rho equal to rho star, okay. So if I take the functional derivative, you see that immediately this will be lambda square coming from this del rho del lambda and here there will be a factor 2 because you know it can be rho lambda can come from this or from this. So we will get 2 log and there will be a constant term here equal to 0. So this is the saddle point equation. Okay. 
And you know, if you think for a while, I mean, what you are doing, I mean, this is just the, you know, this equation here, here. So this is just the energy conservation equation, right? This is the potential energy. So you think of this charge. So it's filling this potential energy. This is the net repulsion potential energy due to the other charges. And so this is just the energy conservation. So saddle point equation means just the energy conservation condition. Now, first thing that you notice is, which is not so obvious, is that you want to find the solution of this equation. Okay. So first thing is you notice that if you want to you know, find a solution, so clearly your rho lambda cannot be over, over the infinite space. It has to be on a finite space. It has to have a finite support, this rho lambda. Why? Because imagine that, so this equation is valid wherever you know, the, uh, this rho lambda is defined. So imagine that rho lambda was defined over the full infinite space. But then you will see that, you, I mean, for, for if you take lambda to be very large, see this guy is going like lambda square, but that guy here can at most go like log lambda, right? So it can never compensate this guy. You will never have a solution, okay? So the only possibility is that, that the solution has a finite support. So rho, lambda, rho star of lambda, saddle point solution, must have a finite support. Finite support means that you cannot go beyond this support. This equation is valid only within this support. Okay. Okay. So, so let's say suppose that you have single support A to B, and we want to find the solution there. So what you can do is take one more derivative of this equation uh, in this. Uh, So by the way, I mean, if I, I was doing for the quadratic case, but you know, you can take any matrix potential V of lambda there. So if you take any V of lambda, this equation will be just V of lambda minus the same thing. Okay. This is just to tell you that this is not just for Gaussian, but you can take any matrix potential and the corresponding equations will be this. Okay. So now within this finite support, I, I can take one more derivative of this equation. So let me, you know, just do the do the general case. Okay, you can in the end you can put lambda square. So if I take one more derivative of this equation, so I get v prime of lambda, right, which is uh, equal to. So this I want to get rid of this guy, so I can take a derivative. So, so then it just becomes 2 times rho of lambda prime but here this has to be interpreted in the principal value sense okay. because when you take the derivative with respect to lambda log of absolute value of lambda minus lambda prime you get lambda minus lambda prime but you know uh, it has to be interpreted in the principal value sense. Okay, that is you have to avoid the lambda equal to lambda. When, the, when you're doing this integral, you have to avoid the point lambda prime equal to lambda. And just okay. So and it has to be over a finite support, so a to b. Now this equation is, is it's a very hard. Okay, so again, I mean, physical interpretation of this equation is what is this? So this is just a force balance condition, right? So you want to find out the energy conservation. So when you take the derivative. So this is just the force, repulsive force. If you have a single test particle, this is the repulsive force due to all other particles, charges on that. And, uh, and this is the you know, force due to the external potential. Okay? So these two forces must balance, balance. So saddle point means precisely that, the energy balance condition. Okay? So, this is, okay. so now, so this is, you know, if you like, you know, this is like a, so what I want to find out, given this, because the potential is given to us, okay? So I want to find out what is the charge density corresponding to that. So in some sense, it's like an inverse electrostatic problem. In the usual electrostatic problem, you know, you are given the charge density, you want to calculate the potential. But here it's like a um, slightly different, you know, morally it's a different problem. And uh, it's like a, you know, you are given this. So it's an integral equation. Okay? And this is, these are called, okay, Cauchy singular value equations.
or sometimes it's called the semi Hilbert transform. Semi Hilbert, semi in the sense, okay, it's a finite Hilbert transform. Okay. So, so how do you solve this equation? Okay. Now, uh, well, so in general, okay, so this will be, I mean, so in general, this is of this form that uh, you have g of lambda equal to something. So I can take this half factor here and write it this way. So g of lambda a to b, you know, some rho of lambda prime. Now, you know, it's, it's not many people know this, because the physicists have developed some methods. You know, there's one method which is called the resolvent method. I won't go into the detail of that because it's too long. But uh, but if you look at any typical book on random matrix theory, like you know, Mehta's book, you know, he just does it. He says, well, you know, if you just put semicircular form, that is, if you just say that rho star of lambda prime equal to square root of two minus lambda square, square over pi. You just put it there and you verify that this satisfies this equation for the quadratic case, which is uh, lambda, right? So in the case of V lambda equal to lambda square over 2, okay. so this will be, uh, sorry, linear case was yeah, 2 lambda, so 2, 2 cancels. Yeah. So for that case, he says, well, you just put it there and you verify that it does satisfy this equation. Okay, but. Okay, it was not very well known. I mean, it was well known in the applied mathematics literature, and engineering literature, but there is an exact solution of such an equation, okay? Assuming that you have a single cut. And this goes to an Italian mathematician, whose name is Tricomi. I mean, when we started working in random matrix theory, I mean, we never saw, you know, the mention of Tricomi anywhere, okay? And, uh, but it was very useful, this uh, Tricomi's results, for, for many problems, which I did not discuss here. Uh, and let me just you know tell you exactly what the Tricomi solution is. I will not prove it, but it's it's a very beautiful explicit solution. Okay. So Tricomi he actually found this solution in 1952. Okay. So you know many people even even the famous paper of Breza, Zix, and Parisi Zuber, you know which is a very famous paper called Planar Diagrams. They tried to you know uh, solve this, but they didn't know about Tricomi. Okay. Because if, it, if they didn't know about Tricomi, it would have been much easier for many of the things. But it was nice because they developed another method to do this, so, which was good. But uh, okay, so the solution is that, so if you have this, you know, whatever the source function is, you want to invert this equation, right? And assuming that it has a single cut solution, single support, A to B, so the explicit solution is this. So A and B are the support of the solution, which you don't know yet. Plus an arbitrary constant. So this is an exact inversion equation. Okay. So you, you give me G of X. And you just have to, you can invert this. So this is the Tricomi solution. Okay. But of course, you know, you still don't know what is A, B, and what is this C0. Okay. So that you have to decide by looking at the problem and the physics of the problem. So I'll just show you how it works for the Gaussian case. And uh, so we remember this picture here. Okay. So maybe I can. So this, this thing here is easy to evaluate. I mean, so for instance, I mean, uh, for us, uh, for the Gaussian case, you remember the equation uh, for the Gaussian case was lambda equal to uh, principal value of uh, rho star lambda prime d lambda prime over d minus lambda minus lambda prime into b. So, so this was just a linear function. So gx was x, basically. Okay. So gx was x. So now you can. So all you have to evaluate is this guy here. So you can actually do that very easily. I mean, you can do it by hand if you are brave, but you can do it by Mathematica, very simple. Okay. So 
So you can check that this will be minus pi over 8 b minus a square plus 4 times b plus a times x minus 8x square. Okay. So that's what we need for our case for the Gaussian case. Okay. Gx is x. So then I have the exact solution, saddle point equation, which tells me that this is just uh, 1 over pi square root of b minus x, x minus a times half I just use this result here plus some other constant c1. Okay. So there are some constant terms which I absorbed in c0 and call it c1. Okay. So now you still have these three unknowns a, b and c1. How do you fix them? So first thing is that you know first physics input that you need is that you see that you know your potential is lambda square right so that means the density must be symmetric in x or symmetric in lambda so this must be some symmetric function okay so if it is symmetric function then uh, what that means is your support so therefore you know if this is b and a then uh, you must have a equal to minus b So symmetry okay. so then it just becomes very simple. So this term disappears, okay. So you just have that. But then you have to still you still have two unknowns. Okay, two means two unknowns, you have one equation of course, which is that rho star x dx you know integral from a to b should be equal to 1 okay so this is one condition you have but you have two unknowns one condition so you have to still in make one more uh, you know physics input this is pi so so now you see that the point is that you know if you again think of physics i mean you know the, your potential is like this so it's repulsive so I mean, what can they do? The charge density it, it must vanish at the uh, at the two ends, right? There is no charge beyond that. Okay, so so you must so rho star x must go to zero as x goes to the support B. Okay, so if that has to happen, see if, if so that that can only happen if c1 equal to b b square because otherwise you know i mean uh, this guy will diverge right so this sort of indicates that c1 must be equal to b square okay so once you have that in order that the density vanishes so the final answer therefore is 1 over pi square root of b square minus x square but now you use the boundary condition because a is minus b so if you just put this factor together so you find this is 1 over pi b must be equal to square root of 2 so square root of 2 minus x square so this is what is called the wigner semicircular law so so you see that square root 2 because i mean i told you that i already rescaled my thing so all the eigenvalues of order 1 so they are in a finite region from minus root 2 to plus root 2 and this functional form of this in the large n limit is just 1 over pi square root of 2 minus lambda square okay so this is the i mean there are many derivation of wigner semicircular law we'll see some other derivation maybe in the next week but uh, but this is a very instructive i mean I, I find it quite physical derivation and you know you actually need it for many other things so so this is uh, Hmm? Sorry, yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's a long range interacting system, okay? Yeah, yeah. it's necessarily mean field. Okay. I mean, mean field, if you want to call it mean field, I mean, I don't know what you mean by mean field. <laughs> Huh? 
Hã? Yes. No, no, no. This you can. I mean, this has been shown rigorously and all these things. Okay, I cannot do all these calculations in the board here. Okay, you can check that this has a single minimum. Physics, just think of physics. You know, if you don't have to bother about maths. Okay, I mean, what else can it be? I mean, it has to have a minimum. Okay, there are two competing terms. I mean, it has to settle down on something, right? Yeah. So, so you know, if if you are if you want to spend a lot of time, you can do go, go calculate the Hessian. But you know, I'm not interested. <laughs> well, if you can do it, it's good. But you know, it's uh, it's not no, it's not that easy. No. Yes, so mu zero was, you know, but you see that, you know, I mean, when I, so mu zero, of course, has to be there. I mean, because you have to evaluate this mu zero. I mean, you remember that the equation was this lambda square over two, sorry, lambda square, was it, yeah, by two, minus whatever the uh, rho lambda prime. So now you can go back and put your solution here, and you, you can find out what a mu zero is. There will be mu zero has a particular value. Okay, it's just a, you, you just doing the Lagrange multiplier usually, right? So you have to. I mean, I just derived it first to get the solution. Once you get the solution, you can put it back here and evaluate your mu zero. And in fact, one interesting thing is that you know you see that you know when you put this semicircular solution back here, <laughs> it's not clear that this whole thing becomes independent of lambda, right? It's not obvious, but it does. I mean, that's the whole point, that the solution is such that this whole thing becomes independent of lambda, and mu naught is just a constant. OK, okay so, so, so therefore, you know, I mean, so now you, know, you have to evaluate this mu naught precisely this way. You know the density, and you can put it back here uh, in the saddle point, and that gives you this, this saddle point energy, basically, the S of uh, rho star lambda. And so what happens in the large end, and okay, one thing I didn't say that, you know, if you think of this large end limit is equivalent to, in some sense, the uh, beta going to infinity limit, right? That's a zero temperature limit. And that's why you are sort of minimizing the energy, you see, this, this is the point, okay? So you can either think of that way or you can think of beta going to infinity limit. So they are both equivalent because this combination always appears together, okay? Yeah. Sorry. No, so it, no, no. So this is exactly what I meant by, you know, because here I'm looking at a globally average quantity, you know, the density things. But if you, for example, if you go close, if you do it simulation, for example, okay, if you do for n equal to say 10, okay, what you will see is that there are finer structures here, oscillations. Okay, this you will not capture by this uh, Coulomb gas approach, okay, because you have to really keep the correction terms and all these things which you have not kept. Okay, but to do this, so then you have to use by this Carnell method, which I'm going to discuss next week, okay? So because, you know, this whole method, you know, the Coulomb gas method is good for globally, global observables, not for local observables, okay? So for local observables, I mean, you have to calculate the correlation functions and spacing distributions, all these things. You cannot do it by this, okay? But, but Coulomb gas is good when you are looking at fluctuations on a scale of, you know, order one, you know, which is large scale, not finer scale fluctuations, okay? Yeah, I mean, if you look at a finer scale, there are, there are, I mean, there are, you know, particles there. I mean, but you know, this is already instructive. This Wigner semicircular, as we'll see in a minute, that you know, you can actually already guess what the scales of fluctuations are, just from this. Okay, I mean, I'll just do it in a minute. Okay, so uh, maybe I should. Okay, can I take? Okay, two minutes. Okay, all right. So this is the average density of state. So let's just see one consequence, and then uh, then I'll stop. I just want to, you know, precisely this question that, that you asked, that is, you know, what can I say? I cannot say much, but I can say what the scales are. Okay, and then, then we'll stop. Okay, so, 
So what we have is that the, the, the density in the large n limit uh, has this uh, with a semicircular form. where lambda is between plus root 2 and minus root 2. Okay. So this is the picture. Okay. So this tells you that you know, it's, it's uh, highest when lambda is close to 0. right? So there the density is square root of 2 over pi. And then as you go, approach the edges, the density goes to density vanishes. Okay. So I can ask, for example, just again, you know, hand off, uh, sort of hand waving argument, but you can sort of still, it's quite instructive to do. I mean, I can ask what is the typical interparticle spacing near the bulk, for instance. So what you see is that in near the bulk, I mean, near the center here, uh, you know, it's, it's more or less flat density here. So you'll say more or less uniform distribution. But can I, can I guess what is the scale here? Okay. So what would be the scale? So scale is obviously going to be order 1 over n, because you are packing n particles in a finite region. So uh, the typical interparticle distance in the bulk should be of order 1 over n. I mean, and to estimate that, basically what you do, again, you can use the Euclidean semicircular law. You say, OK, I integrate this from, let's say, uh, you know, uh, one particle position to another particle position when both are close to the origin, right? So, so you just say that, OK, I mean, I go from uh, uh, 0. That's a zero to delta, and delta is the spacing here, roughly. Okay, I just want to make an order of magnitude estimate. Okay, so this should be equal to one over n, right? Because if the nearest particle, I'm here, I just you know integrate the density over there, and it has to be because it's a fraction. So you know, I mean, if you have one particle, how far do you have to go to get another particle? So the this thing must be equal to one over one over n, right? So if I just substitute near the center, this guy, which is just a constant, square root of 2 over pi times delta is of order 1 over n. So delta is of order 1 over n, So which is normal. As I said, you, know, this is, you have a finite region, and you are packing n particles. If they were uniformly distributed, they would be order 1 over n. And near the bulk, they are. And therefore, it's what, order 1 over n. Now what about the edge? So what happens if you take a typical snapshot of your particle positions? So they'll be you know, uniformly spaced near the center. And then, of course, they are slowly changing. And near the edge, you see, there will be particles will be far apart from each other. They'll be sparse, right? Because you know, the density is very small there. So can I estimate, for instance, I mean, this typical you know, interparticle? So this is a bulk, if you write. And uh, I can ask, what is the, you know, what's a, sort of uh, density, what's the typical scale near the edge, OK? So delta edge. So how do I estimate that? So I mean, again, I, I'll just put root 2 is my limit, right? Beyond which it's not valid. So I just go from root 2 minus delta edge to root 2, and I set it to order 1 over n, OK? So that will give me an idea of this delta edge here. So now I just put this you know, semicircular form back therein. But you see that it has a square root, it has a singularity, which is square root 2 minus lambda to the power half. Right? So OK, this is an exercise. You just put it in here. And because of this root 2 minus lambda, so you have to integrate close to the edge. So when you do that, you see that you get a power of 3 by 2. right? So essentially, what we'll get is delta edge to the power 3 by 2 is of order 1 over n. And therefore, the edge distance, typical distance over which the, the eigenvalues will fluctuate near the edge, is going to scale like n to the power minus 2 third. And this is this famous KPZ exponent, n to the power minus 2 third. So you see this. OK, so, so, the, so the conclusion is that the delta bulk is of order 1 over n, and delta edge is of order n to the power minus 2 thirds. So you get it very cheap, I mean, this, this, this guy, just by looking at the semicircular law. Okay? Now, but, but this is the case. But again, I, mean, I, I want to sort of, you know, make a sort of remark here. If I did not do this rescaling here, remember I had rescaled my lambda to square root of lambda. 
uh, square root of n, right? In order to, to get this, this uh, factor n there. If I don't do it, if I work in the original variables, then you know, instead of root 2, here you will have root 2n. And if you repeat the same exercise, you will see that the delta bulk, so sometimes it's confusing. In the literature, you will see you know, different things. So in that case, delta bulk will be of order 1 over square root of n, because you are putting n particles in a region of width uh, root n. So they have a typical distance to be n to 1 over square root of n. And we repeat the same exercise with the scaling, you will find delta edge to be of order n to the power minus 1 sixth. But they're exactly equivalent. I mean, you know, this uh, n to the power minus 2 third is just a factor of square root of n. You just have to multiply it by square root of n, and you'll get this. Okay. So that, that, that's all there is. But the, so there are two unique uh, sort of scales, uh, distance scales, if you like. One is the typical interparticle distance in the bulk and the typical interparticle distance near the edge. And everything, whatever we'll see later, the scale will be on, this, uh, on these scales, basically. I just wanted to give you this scale. OK, so I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you.